we are looking at the claims of Dr. Zakir Naik about Muhammad in the Bible. And we've got a doozy. <laughs> we've got a doozy here. Uh, because as you pointed out, Sam, uh, in the Quran, 61.6, says that we will find him mentioned by name, right? That's right. And so Muslims have been absolutely desperate to find Muhammad mentioned by name. And this one is absolutely hilarious on oh, yeah. so many levels. Um, let, let, let's, just, let's go to the clip and then we'll look at it. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is also mentioned by name in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the book of Solomon, chapter number 5, <clears throat> verse number 16. It says in Hebrew, Hikkum we kulli Muhammadim Zaidudi wa Zairai Baina Jerusalem, which means he's most sweet. His mouth is most sweet. He's altogether lovely. He is my beloved. He is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. They have translated Hikkum Amitakim, we kulli Muhammadim. Now, in the Semitic languages, to give respect, Im is added. Like for God, for Elo, they add Elohim for respect. Similarly to the name of the last and final messenger, Muhammad, they have added Im, so it becomes Muhammadim. But they have translated Muhammadim as altogether lovely. But if you refer to the original text in the Old Testament, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned by name. How is this hilarious? <laughs> let, let me count the ways. Yeah. Um, Song of yeah. Solomon. Lots of Muslims complain about sexual content in the Bible. Say, therefore, it can't be the word of God. It can't be the word of God if it's talking about sex. This would pose some problems for both the Quran and especially the Hadith if Muslims took it seriously, but Muslims aren't generally consistent with their criticisms. But if you want to say something about sexual content in the Bible, it doesn't get any more sexual than the book Song of Solomon. The entire book is about a loving and sexual relationship between a man and a woman. And they're constantly praising each other for their physical attributes. And the, the, the man's praising the woman for her beauty. She's praising uh, the man for being uh, so just physically fit and just, just uh, an all-around phenomenal man. And so Muslims who complain about all this sexual content in the Bible then go to the most sexual book of the Bible, go right to the middle of it and say, you see, this is talking about Muhammad here. Yeah. And by this the way, one is talking about Muhammad. You do, you do want to make it clear when you say man and woman, it's actually between a husband and a wife. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, want, not just, it's not just some partying yeah. teens here. Because we don't want to give Muslims yeah. the impression that the Bible condones fornication. Mm -hmm. The Bible mm -hmm. condemns all forms of sexual immorality, including fornication. This mm -hmm. is a conversation between a husband and wife, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. Solomon and his wife, mm -hmm. and they're romanticizing one another. So, yeah, mm -hmm. of all the books they could choose, this is the one they choose. To and let's out. go, and, and there, there are all kinds of stuff, right? There's all kinds of stuff in here when they're talking about how hot they, they are. But in, in this passage, let's read it. Now, let's start. Remember, context, context. Let's just start at verse 10 so we can see the immediate context of this verse. So chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. This is a woman talking. My beloved is dazzling and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. His cheeks are like a bed of uh, balsam, banks of sweet-scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. This guy's got a six pack here. <laughs> His legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is full of sweetness and he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So, this so is that Jerusalem, verse right? 16, yeah. That verse 16 is the one where Muslims want to say what it actually should be translated as, his mouth is full of sweetness and he is Muhammad. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So after constantly saying, oh, his abdomen and his legs and he's so ripped and he's so awesome, yeah. suddenly it's talking about Muhammad, right? That's the argument. <laughs> yeah, that is the argument. Uh, but notice the context is speaking <coughs> of someone who's in Jerusalem, daughters of Jerusalem. 
So this is a conversation that's taking place between a husband and wife. In fact, if you read just the beginning of the, of the book, the chapter, it's Solomon speaking to his wife and her responding you know, with intimate words. Anyway, this is taking place in Jerusalem. Now let's put the geographical location aside. Let us assume it's Muhammad just because the term in Hebrew, Mahmadim. Now notice how he pronounced it, Muhammadim. Yeah. More accurately it would be Mahmadim, yeah. uh, which comes from Mahmad. But let's again assume that because Mahmad sounds like Muhammad, therefore, this clearly is a prophecy of Muhammad. Well, if we're going to use that, that method of interpreting the scripture, you got problems, Muslims, mm -hmm. because this is what I call the phonic fallacy. Mm -hmm. Just because two words from two different languages sound similar, therefore, the conclusion is it must be referring to the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's the assumption that Zachar Naik is operating under. Well, if that's the case, then Zachar Naik has, has managed to prove that when Muslims say Allahu Akbar, guess what they're saying, David? Oh, well, that would depend on what Akbar means. In Hebrew, Akbar means mouse. I'm not exaggerating. In fact, <clears throat> let me give you the references where you can see the Hebrew term Akbar. It's Leviticus chapter 11, verse 29. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and verses 11 and 18. And Isaiah 66, 17, there the term mouse or rat is used. And if you go back to the Hebrew, it's Akbar. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if I'm going to employ the methodology used by Zakir Naik and other Muslim Dawagandists, then I must conclude that whenever Muslims say Allahu Akbar, they must be saying Allah is a mouse because Akbar sounds similar to the Hebrew word Akbar, and in Hebrew it means mouse. Yeah. So, so just to, if, you, if, you, if you're not clear on this, think about this. If a Christian or a Jew or whoever were to come up to you Muslims after you shout Allahu Akbar yes. and were to say to you, what? How dare you? How dare you call God a mouse? Yes. Your response would be, what are you talking about? We didn't call God a mouse. And suppose he says to you, but Akbar in Hebrew is mouse. Your response would be, I'm not speaking Hebrew, I'm speaking Arabic. Precisely. But what did you just do? You just rejected Zakir Naik's reasoning, right? Here's a word, Mahmud. Oh, it sounds kind of like Muhammad, so we'll just go to this book. <laughs> we'll just go to Song of Solomon. It's all about sex. Go to the verse in the middle of this woman praising this man for his physical attributes and say this verse is talking about Muhammad because it sounds, like, uh, it sounds a little bit like Muhammad. Yeah. Well, guess what? Akbar sounds exactly like, Mus like Muslims pronounce it, right? Yep, it's, uh, exactly. In Hebrew, it sounds exactly like it. So if you accept Zakir Naik's reasoning, you have to accept it when someone says that when you claim, uh, when you say Allah is greater, you're actually saying Allah Precisely. is a mouse. And the only way around it is to reject Zakir Naik's entire methodology, but you don't want to do that because he's your champion. Right? Precisely. He's one of the most popular <laughs> apologists out there. And not only that, another problem is, if he's going to be consistent, he should look for... Every occurrence of the term Mahbat in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, this, is, this is the word. This is the word that's used exactly. throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. In fact, in Song of Solomon 5.16, it's the plural form of Mahmad. It's Mahmadim. If he really wants to be consistent, he should find the singular form, right? Mm -hmm. Mahmad. Well, lo and behold, we find Mahmad used in several passages. And again, for the sake of time, let me just show you what happens. If I were to employ his method of interpreting the scriptures, which is actually even worse than just... I said Jesus. It's pure distortion of scripture. Let me show you what happens. Ezekiel 24, 21. <clears throat> Same word Mahmad is used. Ezekiel 24, 21. Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the Muhammad of your eyes. I'm going to profane Muhammad. So here's the prophecy that God says he's going to profane, humiliate, disgrace, destroy Muhammad. So again, I want to thank Zakir Naik for helping us establish that according to the Bible, Muhammad, a.k.a. Muhammad, is something, someone profane and disgusting to God, and God is going to destroy him. And you can actually do that with a bunch of passages sure. in the Old Testament. We'll go ahead and link to that article, but let, just to recap here, if you Muslims believe in Zakir Naik's reasoning, you've, you haven't proved that Muhammad is a prophet. You prove that Allah is a mouse, and you prove that God, the mouse, will profane and disgrace <laughs> yeah. Muhammad. This is what happens if you actually take the arguments of your greatest apologists seriously.